In this week's episode of Unfiltered, real talk about the business of content creation, I'm speaking to a creator who is fairly new to the content creation game, this time around anyway. His name is Rel Rugely, and you can find his mouth-watering and sometimes hilarious content about where to eat next on Instagram and TikTok. We are having a very real and raw conversation about the pros and cons of being a content creator while also holding down a full-time job, what it's like to work with brands in his particular niche, and how he plans to branch out in the future from the type of content that he's creating now. I think this interview is going to be very eye-opening, and I hope you will enjoy it. Okay. Hey, Rel. Thank you so much for agreeing to be on my podcast today. I'm so excited to talk to you because a lot of the creators I work with and a lot of the creators I come across, they want to hear the story of someone kind of like just kind of getting into this, taking this thing seriously and growing their audience and their platforms from scratch. And I thought you'd be the perfect person to kind of speak to this because I've noticed things are just happening (laughs) on your end. And so I'm really excited to hear. But And so I know all about you and how you, maybe a little bit of your background, but my audience may not know. So would you just take a few minutes to introduce yourself, tell me what it is you do and uh, how you got into content creation in the first place? Absolutely. Well, first off, thank you for having me. Uh, to anybody watching, hello to, I call her Miss Tony. Miss Tony's audience. Uh, I'm super excited to be here and chat with you all. I am a food and beverage content creator. I've been creating it for years now um, under many different hats. I branded myself as a photographer before. I've tried a little bit of fashion, just hopping all over the place. So this is where I finally found my footing. I'd say I've been doing food content consistently for a little over a year now which has taken a while to kind of find my footing within that. Uh, but through being consistent, it kind of led me to the growth that you just noted too. So the co- I love your content because, you know, I'm in the food mm-hmm. and I like to, you. if I'm getting ready to go to a restaurant here in town, I'm first going to go to your site. I'm going to flip through what looks good. Mm-hmm. And then my friends and I, we're going to pick one of the places that, you, that you've gone to. And it's never disappointed. But why did you decide this time around to kind of choose food as the arena? So at first I was just frustrated with myself to be completely honest. I'm like, it's, it was hard for me to want to be in this space of being a content creator. I know that I had at the time I told myself, I know I have the talents, you know, I have this broadcast media degree of, you know, proved that I know the practice itself. But I have so many interests and sometimes I feel like I have undiagnosed ADHD, like to be completely honest. So that showed in how I presented myself online. And then also I wasn't a hundred percent involved in uh, the hats that I was wearing at those times. Like photography, for example, loved it as a hobby, loved working with certain people, certain influencers, but I didn't like it on a full scale of just like being completely available to the public and taking on a bunch of clients that I didn't know. I kind of felt like I was getting thrown around in that way. So I was like, well, you love to eat. You love to cook, even though I haven't shown much of that yet. But I just told myself, stick with this because it comes easy to you and you can consistently put this out every single week. We eat every single day. So whether it was me eating out or cooking at home, I'm like, okay, you can take one of these and make something out of it. Like use that background, use that storytelling ability and your personality and put it into the content. So that was my initial challenge to just have some type of niche to where I could be consistent and show consistency to myself. I had to prove that to myself and it ended up being food because it was most efficient for me to create and the consistency just led to like cultivating a following here in Austin. That's a, that's a new perspective, a different perspective than I've been thinking about because a lot of creators ask me, like, I don't know how to find my niche. I don't know, you know what to create. I have so many different passions, so many different things I'm interested in. And the way you said it, like, it was efficient for you. It's like, yes, I liked it. Yes, I know it. But it's also efficient because I eat every day. Mm-hmm. Uh, I feel like it's, I think sometimes we have to ask ourselves as creators, one, what are we passionate about? Um, and then two, what can we do, I guess, like kind of for work, if you plan on doing this full time, like 
I like to say when we go to our jobs every single day, right? Um, some people may not 100% love what they do. It may be around like 70, 75, but like we have bills to pay, right? And I kind of have that mindset when it comes to creating content. Like, yes, I love food. I'm passionate about it. I love being able to share my thoughts on it. And I think it's super valuable when people are able to take that and then create their own experiences around food. Um, but it also has to be, speaking of creating content, it also has to be a niche that um, I can consistently put out and like not get burnt out on. So that's why efficiency was important for me because I there's there's a bunch of things that I have the skill to do, um, but it was about choosing something I'm not going to get burnt out on and something that um, I won't get tired of or stressed out about. Because if I were making photography content, that could be something that would burn me out. And do I consider myself to be a good photographer? Yes. Like, do I have conf uh, do I have clients that would vouch for me? Yes. But it's another thing to then take on that role and become the teacher of that. It's like it's just a different ball game. But with food, I'm like I can't make myself anxious about this because it's literally just food. These are my taste buds. I'm just sharing my opinion and what's authentic to me. So with that formula, that takes away the stress and hard work that often that I often experience when it comes to creating content. I can overthink easily. So this was something that I was like, okay, you can't overthink it too much. Like it's it's just food. So right. Well, you said it's just food, and this is your opinion, and mm -hmm. these are my taste buds. Yeah, yeah. But even in this arena where it's like, like this is just what I like. Y'all can like it or hate it. Do you mm -hmm. get any negative comments or negative feedback? Have you experienced any of that yet? I definitely have. It's been something that I have to learn to navigate through. Naturally, I'm always on the defense. I'm like, who are you talking to? You're not coming at me crazy. That's just... <laughs> Like how I was raised to just defend myself and, you know, not take anything from anybody. Um, but I've realized it's in the social media space in general, a lot of it is just projection. And as time has passed, I've grown to see that although some people are in my comment section regarding a post about food, they really have a problem with uh, maybe the restaurant or maybe like a price because they're not comfortable paying a certain amount. You know, it's mm -hmm. there's just varying opinions opinions about that so i've taken note of that and i've said okay this isn't always a personal attack against you and sometimes i feel like it is it's not always that situation it's not always easy to just like block it off and say oh we're not they're not coming for me sometimes they are um and it's more closely to like how much did you get paid for this or they're paying you to say this and i'm like y'all have no idea <laughs> that is not the right. case there was actually no financial compensation around this you know what i mean uh, outside of sometimes having the meals covered, right? And even with that, I'd like for people to know you can't pay me to lie about something. And I think a lot of other creators can agree with this. It doesn't benefit us as someone that the audience is looking toward for a truthful opinion, right? To then lie about that and then ruin that relationship with the audience, right? Um, are there going to be times where I go somewhere and I like the food and then I recommend it and then someone tries it and maybe they don't like it? That's very possible. We all have different taste buds. I go out to eat with Tyler, my partner, all the time. He likes peanut butter. I hate peanut butter. Like, you know, it's there's just certain things that we may not see eye to eye on. But that's why I try and do my best to respond to those negative comments with just more information and also trying to give them an alternative perspective as well. And even within my videos, I say like, hey, this isn't, this wasn't for me. This doesn't fit my flavor profile personally. Um, but if you like these certain things, I try and give more examples and be really descriptive, um, then this might be for you. And that's kind of how I deal with that. There is, when you just said, you know, I'm not going to lie and I'm not going, you know, most creators aren't going to. I don't know if you've had the chance uh, yet to work with any brands uh, in your content. Have you? Um, a few. Uh, one example where it's like a, a milk brand. I can't think of the name off the top of my head, <laughs> um, but they're like a dairy alternative. So that's been one example. And then like Quest, chips, protein stuff. So not very many, but a few mm -hmm. food brands. Yeah, I'm not sure if you've you've uh, run into this yet, but I'm pretty sure as 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 you grow as you grow, you're going to run into a situation where you know brands offer to pay you to do a post and it's not really something that aligns with your audience or it's not something you're into or it's like, oh, I already know, I don't like this X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. But um, 
preparing for that to happen. You know, I can I can assume as a especially a new creator, and as brands start reaching out and offering you, you know, money for posts, it can be kind of difficult to turn that down or to kind of say, well, that would be nice. This check would be nice, mm -hmm. but I'm sorry, I just can't. Yeah. Have you thought about that? I, I definitely have, and I've just landed on. Well, and maybe it feels different because I haven't been met with that just yet. Mm -hmm. um, but I've landed on what's going to benefit me long term. I, I've seen examples of various makeup creators that have been called out on TikTok, like have these huge platforms and have been called out for um, false advertising. And I just feel like ultimately that's not worth it. I know like we live in the cancel culture, um, in which sometimes doesn't even prove to be real, depending on who you are, people shortly get over that stuff. But yeah, I just feel like if we're talking about building an audience that trusts in you and like building community, it's important to be honest about those things. Um, I have had situations to where a brand has asked me to remove something like a, a more honest critique out of a video. And that was something that I dealt with. Uh, the situation was an application that is, uh, it's new, it's a new startup tech company, but it's used to uh, promote deals on food. So you may go to a restaurant's website, just checking out their menu. And with this specific application, you'll see a prompt that says like, hey, enter your email here. Like obviously they collect that information for like $25 off your next visit. It's one of those type of apps. So mm -hmm. the deal was to visit one of the apps within your network for like National Pizza Day mm -hmm. and uh, went to the place. Like the experience wasn't terrible. Honestly, they were just a little bit understaffed. And it took a while to get like even the first drink, uh, the appetizer, and then like later the pizza that was coming to us. And um, I mentioned it in a video in the most respectful way. I think my exact mm -hmm. words were, um, they were a little bit understaffed. You could tell they're busy, but you know, the food finally got out to us and it was good once it came. It was something along those lines. And it's because I have that in my core of like, you have this duty to tell the audience like the truth or what your experience actually was, right? And um, so the brand reviews the footage, they're like, hey, uh, we normally try to uplift our businesses that we partner with, which I didn't think this was tearing them down. I just think it was honest and it, it wasn't the most favorable uh, description of that, but it was realistic and it was kind of meant to prepare people of what they might expect, right? And so I went back and forth with myself. I'm like, ah, I'm not necessarily taking too much away from the audience because it wasn't a review of the food itself. It was more about using the app for this deal. This is where we use this deal. Um, so I told them for that exception, I'm like, okay, well, since this isn't an actual review of like the service, it's more about promoting the application itself. I can take that part out. But along with that, I just didn't make it about the food at all. Yeah. Um, I just like, this is national pizza day. Here's where we are. This is what we ate. This is how we saved money on this purchase through this app. And I just kind of left my opinions on the food in anything that was restaurant specific out of it. Yeah, when it comes to uh, sponsored brand deals, creators sometimes have to walk a fine line between, you know, look, this is my opinion and I'm gonna put my two cents in and I'm going to share your brand in the most favorable light that I can, but also you're not gonna put words in my mouth. Mm -hmm. And lots of, a lot of brands, attempt to do that. It's like, no, say this, this, and this. It's like, well, no, I'm not going to say that because that wouldn't be true. And mm -hmm. I don't like being untruthful. Right. But I'm sure you more. there's more of that to come as mm -hmm. you uh, grow. I can see lots of brands wanting to work for you, not just food brands too, but mm -hmm. brands that are, like you talk, ex explained about the other brand, mm -hmm. that are associated with food. Yeah. Uber Eats, good to go. Uh, you know, all these, even meal prep mm -hmm. can, probably can fit into your, your brand. And that's but, what I uh, plan to do with yeah. it too, expand just yeah. on that. I'm like, taking yeah. mental notes, like she's naming some good yeah. brands. But I love that you started out, look, mm -hmm. people are afraid to niche down. You started out with a niche being food. And it's also mostly, I mean, you do do food reviews when you travel. It's mostly right here, local in your hometown. Mm -hmm. So that is pretty niche. But then from there, you can branch out, you can go, you know, start doing 
preparing meal at home, meals at home. You can do all kinds of things with that. So <laughs> I, I really love it. And it's all up to you, you know, which direction you want to take, take this in. So you've already had some brands reach out to you, a few. Mm -hmm. How long, I know you said it took like a year, this last year, like growing, like being consistent, but mm -hmm. how long did it take? Do you remember like more or less how long for, before a brand actually reached out to you? So regarding food, I want to say probably after the six month mark, um, somewhere within that time frame, I think it just took consistency, honestly, because I just hit 10K uh, definitely sometime this year. I feel like maybe in February, February or March, and we're now in May. Mm -hmm. um, and then that was my goal for the longest time because I've been stuck at Kevin. 10K was my goal for so long because I've been stuck at 7K for a very long time. And then once it hit 10, it just kept going. So it just mm -hmm. continues to grow, right? Um, but I want to say brands started noticing more for food um, after at least six months, if not longer. Um, so it definitely took some like time and dedication. What I realized was that the feed, my feed had to look a certain way or they'd have to see me talking about it in stories. Like, a lot of brands lately want to see uh, more organic usage of it. Now I have this conversation with my content, you know, friends that who do this full time, right? Mm -hmm. um, when their managers, which is something that I can't wait to have eventually, because I don't like having the tough conversations, right? Yeah. Um, when they have those conversations, the brands are kind of wanting to see what it looks like to work with the creator already before they're starting to invest the money. I feel like we used to be in a space to where it was a lot easier to receive PR and it's it still can be there's definitely been certain brands that haven't had the budget to work with me but have wanted to send me things to try and even through trying them organically I felt uh inclined to just talk about it to my audience uh but they are in a space where they they want to see an example it's almost like they want to get like a an ad done already before they send you the money you know to mm -hmm. to execute that um, but yeah, that, that six month period, I, and I'll talk to a few people and they kind of said somewhere around that range. Some people, it takes longer, even a year. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And some creators aren't prepared or are not aligned with how long it can take before you start seeing money, mm -hmm. which means that, you know, you've got to love with your, what you're doing because you are working basically for free, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And until you get to a certain point and then it starts to slowly take off and you'll see it just, you know, the more you work with brands, other brands will notice you and it will mm -hmm. just continue to snowball. But it's like getting through that first six months to a year consistently. And we're going to talk mm -hmm. about consistency because that's something yeah. that people always like consistent, consistent. I can't be consistent. I'm not, not consistent. What does that mean to you being consistent? And then how do you stay consistent? Consistency to me means to put out the content or just consistently work towards uh, showcasing what it is that you're trying to offer or build an audience from, regardless of who's watching. Like, the, I know a lot of people, a lot of my friends, I'll say, who are interested in like, I kind of want to start, but you know, I put this video out and it only got like uh, some low number for views, right? And it didn't, it didn't take off, right? And I just always think about my friends like Raven, for example, who have been doing it since before we were like even had a closer friendship since like middle school. Like, right. I remember seeing that online, people who just did it for fun. And I feel like anybody who was into like OG influencers or OG YouTubers, if they've watched their interviews, they all have that same thing to say that they were doing it for years before the money actually came in. Right. And for me, I just keep the end goal in mind. I know that. It's almost like building a portfolio. So mm -hmm. I'll try and think of it from the brand side too. If I am a scout, marketing scout, uh, creator manager, if I'm looking through Instagram for someone's profile, I want to see multiple examples across the feed of what it is that I'm looking to hire them for. Because hiring them is an investment. All these brands need to see a return on their investment. At the end of the day, it is a business. And I think a lot of people forget about that. Some people will say, oh, well, this is my price and just throw numbers out there based on what they want to receive. But in order for the collaboration to be successful, a brand is going to look to make, you know, a certain amount higher 
uh, than what they've invested in you. So I, I kind of keep that in mind too. So I'm like, okay, cool. If I were giving an elevator speech and I was highlighting these key points about who I am as a creator, um, what would those things be like? And then I have those lists of things and try to see, does my feed say that about me? Does my feed say who I am as a creator? Does my feed say I cook at home all the time and I'm working, you know, using these certain products to make my food and my audience is engaging in the comments talking about it because those are the things that they look for. And those are on my, my goal list um, as I start to incorporate more of the at-home stuff. Because like we said, it, it can take a while for like money to start to come in. And um, that's kind of where I am. I'm at a point of... I've had successful collaborations within food and the numbers have been ridiculous for what I've produced, like for restaurants, like uh, the amount of potential customers. It's been really significant mm -hmm. for some, for a lot of videos. And um, it's a new space for restaurants. They all don't have uh, the budget. I know we're talking about like finances and stuff, but for creators who are interested right. in food, that's, that's the truth. Um, especially when it comes to local. And I like to think of it as if it's like McDonald's or some chain, right? They're everywhere. But if we're talking about this new restaurant that's just now starting in Austin, they, they're not going to have the same budget. They may not even have the systems to know what that return looks like. You know, uh, we, we're not giving out discount codes or anything that's helping us to track the service or the amount of potential customers that we're sending to the business. You know, those are logistics that I hope to get involved with and change at some point. Um, yeah. Not the biggest yeah. tech person, but that would just be so beneficial for creators to then come back and say, hey, this video that I did for free, whether I spend my own money or, you know, whether you guys compensated the food, these are the results. Would you like to work again? You know? Right. That is something that's very important. It would be important to the, the restaurants and the brands too, because they need some education around this whole influencer marketing, social media marketing thing. You mm -hmm. know, that's my thing, helping businesses too. Mm -hmm. get more visibility, get more clients through social media. And that is it. I mean, that's what's going on right now. You're going to mm -hmm. have to jump on the bandwagon. Right. And whether uh, a, a, an influencer comes into your place of business and makes you, gives you some free content, that's, I don't under, I don't know why they don't understand how golden that is. Some people don't see the value in it, honestly. I, I've had these talks with my friends who are in the same food space, and that's why I'm so big on community. I love that aspect of creating food in Austin. There are a lot of food creators. People have their favorites, people who they can relate to more, whatever else. But I love that I'm connected in real life friends with some of them because it takes that community and these type of discussions and mentioning like pay rates and stuff and who paid, who didn't. It takes that in order for there to be change because I feel like as a whole, a lot of restaurants, since it is so new to them, they don't always see the value and what we do. Um, I remember I went to a coffee shop and I don't know if the owner was saying this out of like nerves, but he made the comment along the lines of like, oh yeah. And like, of course I'll, I'll like comp this for you. Um, almost as if it was like doing me a favor and that turned on a light bulb in my head. I'm like, oh, they don't get it. <laughs> like they don't, they don't understand that it's not as easy. And it's, it's not like, oh, this is some cool, fun hobby. You know what I mean? So a lot of the restaurant owners or business people in general, they may not realize the amount of work that goes into creating the content. I do have a broadcast media background and a lot of my tactics or script writing or just storytelling abilities uh, stem from that. And you don't need that at all to create the content, right? Mm -hmm. You have people who have never been in like a film class in their life and they are making outstanding content that is performing very well. But I say all that to say they may not realize the value and like, the favor that's really being done for them, right? Because even if it's, say I create a video and it has like much lower viewership or a lower amount of saves than like my higher performing videos, uh, it's still like a free service to them. It's still like an ad. It's almost like if you were paying for a commercial for the Super Bowl, right? It's like, that's like a big global scale and you got a lot of people's eyes like for that moment. It's still being put in front of them that there's still value I say that to say there's still value within like user generated content, right? So I don't know if that's understood across the board, but I feel like it's up to creators to kind of speak about that and explain that in our consultation meetings or responding to emails and people are, are pitching themselves or aren't sending invites to us to come to the restaurants or whatever it is. It's up to us to kind of hone in on that and explain like, hey, this is the value. This is what my analytics usually look like. 
Uh, you can see an example of the comments of how many people say that they're going to try this or, you know, the saves and the shares. You really have to present that to some people who don't get it. So I've been trying to do a bit more of that. I've been taking on that responsibility. And that's that's true, not just for restaurants and food businesses, for other businesses, local especially. I know for speaking about the food business, whenever I try a place and I've tried several places that you've recommended, especially if it's a more a smaller where it's it's likely to be the same people waiting on you. I will say mm -hmm. I'm here because of Rails video. Mm -hmm. I'll let you. them know that that's why I'm here. I'm trying this because he said it. Uh, and they say, thanks a lot. And some, some uh, brands, I'm thinking of a specific brand that Raven uh, company we were, worked with. I think it's our esthetician. It's like a, where you go and get you know, your eyebrows and your lashes and your Botox and stuff done. Mm -hmm. And the very first time we went, they, ex she explained, you know, who she was not asking for anything. And they did the services. Of course, she gave them a shout out. It wasn't sp sponsored or anything in the video. And then the next time she went, I don't think they've charged her since mm -hmm. because they're like, you. they're saying we're still getting business. Now that's a business who, is aware of social media value mm -hmm. and also is a, is a business who has the privilege of asking their customers, how did you hear about us? Mm -hmm. You know, a restaurant may not do that, but right. you know, a, a day spa or a esthetician or whatever, they might, they can say, how did you hear about me? And mm -hmm. they know that, or people will just volunteer. Hey, I've never tried this service, but I heard about it on Raven Elise's channel and they understand they're like the least we could do is give y'all free mm -hmm. services you know mm -hmm. services aren't aren't inexpensive either but mm -hmm. you know because we know we're getting business but there was been another occasion where uh, let's say her closets you know expensive closets and you know talk to the owner that i've worked with for years and years not just a brand new business and said hey can you give her a discount because she's going to talk about this in her video and the owner's like, yeah, no, we just, we, 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 you know, it's how it's local, you know, how many local people are going to be. But then the owner's son mm -hmm. came later to fix something. And I explained to him and I said, your dad was not down for that. He was like, what? That's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. He still couldn't talk him into it, mm -hmm. but having the feeling like, um, well, it's local. How many people watch her that actually live in Austin and, if it's if it's going to expose you to even a hundred people, and ten percent of that hundred, those hundred people might be building a closet, would it not be worth it for you just to give her a few dollars off this thing? It just doesn't. Exactly. It it's it's about, and I'm glad as as small smaller or growing creators are thinking about educating the brands about what it's like to work with an influencer and how it can benefit them. Yes. Yeah. I think it's, I think what you said with the example of there being a son who I'm assuming of course would be younger mm -hmm. than, you know, mm -hmm. the father, someone being kind of like the middle man there to kind of explain what that is. Right. It's like, again, the younger generation kind of taking that on because, you know, some people are still like social media. What? I don't even have a Facebook. They're just focused on, you know, running their business successfully mm -hmm. with whatever that looks like. I think it's important to have even those advocates too. So, we definitely have to take ownership of that. And I want to say too, because I don't want it to seem like there's a bunch of businesses that just completely ignore it. There have been businesses that we visited. Again, uh, Paperboy is one of them. I love them for breakfast. Um, that's the first time we went back after me posting a video. That's one of my, I think that was my first video to get a crazy amount of views, like over 300,000, which is a lot for me. Um, and that was just on TikTok. It got a lot on Instagram as well. Um, but we went back and while we were eating, like a bunch of people like kept looking over to the table, but I'm always like, it, we're in Austin, like people are gonna look yeah. like, that's just like how it is, right? Um, and I think I may have forgotten something. So as I was coming back to get a pair of glasses, I was leaving and um, I kid you not, three different people and a, two of them had driven from far away. One was from San Antonio, another one was from, was from Houston. And they were like, oh my God, we're literally here because of you, look, like we're eating the exact same thing. And I was like, Gosh. oh, this is a thing. And then they were all vouching. They were telling the servers, like, did y'all give him a discount? Like, he needs to have something. You know what I mean? They were really advocating. 
So that felt good. I felt like yeah. I hit so many tech points that day. I'm like, you have people who are listening, trusting your opinion. They're here because of you. The restaurant wins because of that. They're literally ordering the exact same thing and they're enjoying it. So that felt good too. It just felt like affirmation. And I'm glad that something like that happened so early on because it positively affected the trajectory of my food content creating experience. Um, and it's been a continuation of that. So there have been other restaurants that have definitely showed love whenever we've gone back. So I'm definitely appreciative of that. And I'm I'm not the person that like has my hand out like, hey, y'all owe me. It's not yeah, really yeah. that, you know what I mean? Yeah. But it does help when people appreciate the value. That's, that's the biggest thing is that yeah. they know the value and know that there's time and effort put into this and me knowing the other side of it of when I have worked with brands that have a budget, you know, for the same mm -hmm. amount of work or less, like it's, that's what's constantly on my mind. So I'll continue yeah. to do my part and, you know, like let them know I think it's important. And here's the thing, as a legitimate business, you're going to have a budget for marketing and advertising anyway. You're going to be spending your advertising money. So let's say you can put an ad on one of the local radio stations, mm. pay I don't know how much money, it's going to run a couple of three times. It's going to go out to everybody who's listening to the station who may or may not be your ideal customer. Mm -hmm. But you have someone like you who not only tells but shows what you had. And the people who, as you're building your following, you building your following, these people follow you because they're like, he likes the kind of food I like. Mm -hmm. They're not just following you because you make food content because you're cute, but you are. <laughs> but they follow you because it's like, well, he, I like, boy, he recommended this one. So as a, as a business owner, I don't understand how they don't see that this is far more valuable. It's more targeted influence than just a newspaper ad, a Yellow Pages ad, a magazine piece or something. And by taking advantage of that, in fact, there's a story I know about a local, not lo local-ish food company. You've heard of Siete Chips, the Siete Gluten-Free? I have. Mm -hmm. Right. right. I didn't know they were local. Ago. Well, they're, they're from not too far away. If they're Texas. Oh, okay. They're oh, okay. Maybe the Valley. But gotcha. I knew, I worked with a person who knew the family when they were first getting started, before they were in any grocery stores or anything. They maybe went to farmer's markets, maybe I have this wrong, or just uh, events and gave away their products and had people post about them. Mm. That's how they were able to bootstrap wow. that whole business with all these gluten-free products that they have. They had a great product. Great. They had great branding. Okay, now how do we get the word out? Mm -hmm. That's how they did it. And other businesses, I think, should probably follow suit, especially for a new business when you ain't got money. Right. Give, 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 give away a meal. Come on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> give, give. It, I, I'm telling you, when I look at I, the other day, I was trying to do the math. Like I said, this video got like a low amount of shares, but a certain amount of bookmarks. Right. But even just counting the people, even just counting the amount of people in the comments that said they were going. I'm like, if you take one person or even a couple they're spending at least between like 80 to 100, you know, if you're really enjoying dinner. I'm like, it costs nothing to do. You know, like if you compare the return on that investment of offering like a, a free date night or something like that, like it, it's more smart. And I, I'm so glad that you pointed out that there's something to be said about like the targeted audience, Absolutely. right? Directly through the creator. So you're right. It doesn't, it's not much of a loss in my opinion. So yeah, it, it takes a lot, a little bit of education. Hopefully one day we'll get to a point where all brands understand this. Yeah. And, you know, influencer marketing is a thing. You know, I hear a lot about how much money brands pay and they earn every penny. They earn every penny. They, they provide, they make you work for it. Most mm -hmm. of the brands make you work for it. But then also is... It is not apples to apples, a television commercial and having an influencer do a three minute integration. It's not the same. Mm -hmm. And if even if it if it were similar, 
what would you pay to have a camera crew, makeup, hair, lighting, mics? I've been in those big productions where they mm -hmm. have a crew. Plus pay, plus pay the talent. Mm -hmm. What would that call? Edit, who's going to edit it? The mm -hmm. influencer is doing all of that. All of it. Sometimes just by themselves. And so, absolutely, they deserve every penny. And you are going, if you do it right, if you allow the creator to put their spin on it and, and, and create this content in a way that's going to speak to their clients, I mean, their viewers, then you're going to get an ROI. You're going to get your return on investment. That's all there is to it. We Let's talk about that a little bit more, too, because with certain brand deals I've got outside of food, or, you know, there's always going to be certain key points, key talking points that you have to hit, and that's expected. Like, it's obviously to provide information to the audience. But one thing that I have always felt like, oh, I wish this rule was a little bit different, was the rule of having to show the product within the first three seconds. Mm -hmm. That's one that I'm like, man, I'm losing some people within the first three seconds because I'm already showing the product too early. And I feel like when you're focusing on storytelling, which is what good marketing is, you, know, it, you have to sometimes let things build up a little bit. Now there's, with food, it's a, it's a bit different. I've seen creators on TikTok start off talking about something you can see like the soda can in the front or their food. I don't know. I feel like it varies, but I feel like it's easier to kind of embed stuff like that mm -hmm. earlier on in the content. Mm -hmm. But for people who are, judging the first three seconds and like scrolling through. If you are hitting them with that first line, that could be just enough to lose them because we naturally, I don't know what studies have been done on it, but we naturally don't like to see things that are sponsored. You can see when people have that in the top corner, like, oh, paid uh, sponsored post or whatever. Mm -hmm. People naturally think that if they're paying you for it, that it's invalid, it's false, you're lying, you're not telling the truth because a paycheck is associated with it. And that's not true, you know? Um, or in, it, it may be true for some people, but most of the people I know have a bit more integrity and respect for their following and just want to do the right thing and kind of talk about things in uh, a truthful way. But yeah, that's one thing that I, and I think it's changed for some people, you know, certain brands kind of get it, but I wish everyone got it as a whole, because I understand it is important for the brand to have their needs met, that check needs to be cleared off of the box, but it's something that I feel like, man, if I had a bit more time to ease my audience into what I'm actually doing, I can like pop this in there. I could be talking about a story completely unrelated to the product and then use it and as a, you know. Hook. That's, that hook, they talk about this in social media. You have the hook, you hook mm -hmm. them in. You're not gonna hook them in with, this post is sponsored by XYZ. You're mm -hmm. gonna hook them in with your story, with the beginning of your story. Hook them, get them watching okay, and then boom, hit them with the brand. Mm -hmm. And the brands only understood that. They, they'd be like, okay, well, we just want more people to see us. You know, at least they're going to see it. And even if they're scrolling by, they're going to get a glimpse <laughs> of us. Not all good. It's but not. Brand education has a long way to go. Um, mm -hmm. I wish there were a group of creators that I know <laughs> that would start their own brand management agency Mm -hmm. That would be creator focused. That would be helpful to the brands. It'd be helpful to the creators. It'd be helpful to the brands too. Mm -hmm. Now, I did know that there was a particular agency that used to try and do this. They're out of business now. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe that's why, because the brands have the money. They're like, look, we have the money. Shut up. And just do the work. Right. Yeah. And that's, and, I, and I'm not talking about all brands when I do this, but especially the larger ones that are used to traditional media, that's mm -hmm. what they're looking at. But um, you were mentioning like creatively showcasing a product, whether it's food or whatever. And so I noticed that your content is very creative. I'm just dying laughing. I'm cracking up <laughs> at, at the <laughs> innuendo, the comparisons, the terms that you're using. I am just dying. It's funny. So there's a lot of creativity. You know, your, your content is not, we're not, not downplaying food creators who just say, okay, here it is. I'm going to eat it. Let's try it, see how it is. Mm -hmm. You have a story associated with your with your content. How do you ever struggle with coming up with those creative ideas, or is it just like natural to you? I promise you, I do not. It, it is. I think that's why it resonates with people because if you spend a lot of time around me casually, not working, I know you've been around me mm -hmm. and we've been on mm -hmm. set and stuff, but and also. I respect you as an elder of mine, so I'm not going to completely let loose, right? 
Um, but I just kind of say what comes to mind and a lot of times it ends up being funny to other people. Sometimes I'm like, I should have wrote that down because I'm not trying to, you know? So sometimes I focus and I, if I'm writing some type of script for it, I'm like, okay, this is kind of funny. Like I love words. I love wittiness and wordplay. So I'll try and incorporate that. But other times I'm like, I don't feel like doing that today. I'm just going to talk. Like if I'm watching the video and hitting the record button from my phone, which I do a lot, Mm -hmm. I'll just kind of say the first thing that comes to mind. Um, I will say that if it is something that's sponsored and I'm having to think about certain talking points, yes, I'm definitely spending a little bit more time on that, trying to make sure if it's like a funny joke or reference that is still like appropriate. I don't ever want to do anything that's inappropriate or, you know, uh, distasteful or could like backfire on myself or the brand. But yeah, I, I would say for the most part, it just comes natural. It's not, it's not hard for me to like write or to, to say anything with that's like an analogy that's how my brain we joke about this all the time uh me and one of my friends Daisha you know Daisha um my brain thinks in like wit I don't know how to explain it like you can name a topic right now Mm -hmm. I can make a a rhyme a rap to it and it's gonna make I don't know why (laughs) I think like that but don't put something like a math problem in front of me I'll freak out you know but the creative writing that's like one of my strong points well that's that's very interesting that you said that because I think the, sorry, let me close this door. Okay. So that's very interesting that you said that this, it just comes naturally to you. And I think that's a point that deserves to be made for other creators out there, because that is who you are. You're being your authentic self. You're not, Mm -hmm. this is not a character you created. Although, you know, some people create characters and it works fine. This is not a, create, a character. This is you. So it's easier to authentically be yourself and it comes across more authentically, you know, than if you were just, you know, playing a role. Mm-hmm. So I think that's that's another important part to consider during content creation that you can't be somebody else. You know, Rel can't get on camera and be the next Keith Lee. I can't. He's got to be you. You got to be you. And mm-hmm. It can be just as big as Keith Lee, if that's an aspiration. But, mm-hmm. you know, being yourself, this creator's doing their thing, I'm doing my thing. That's very important to remember as mm-hmm. you're uh, growing your your uh, content. Mm-hmm. But, and, and you, you are very self-assured and you're very confident, but do you ever experience like moments of self-doubt or insecurity around oh, for sure. mean, the type of content that you make too? Yeah, for sure. Uh, In the beginning, too, or sometimes if I see another creator that is doing something in a more uh, simple way, I'll sometimes get discouraged or think like, oh, like, why? Why didn't my content land like that, you know? Um, But I try not to compare too much because I also think about, like, where I'm located and the demographics and, like, things are just different. There's a... Some people don't have to do as much to be successful. And I feel like being a person of color, I feel like I have to work harder sometimes, especially in this space. I know some people who can, you know, in respect to them, it's all love, but can, you know, showcase a place, not say a single word, and it goes crazy, like as far as engagement and stuff, just because a lot of people are there living for that. Um, and sometimes I, I think that maybe I shouldn't write a script, maybe it's it's funny and it's entertaining and there are a good amount of people who enjoy it but like maybe a script is too um professional or maybe that comes across as the same way the sponsor posts to get people there you know so those are some sometimes where i've doubted myself but i also think about the proof that tells me that i'm wrong <laughs> that people do enjoy that from me too so i think it's about having a balance of it all and then also not comparing myself too much because there is a gift in knowing that I create something differently than how someone else would. Um, And I've never looked at things as like a race or like a rush trying to, trying to get to the next point. But yeah, so whenever I have those moments of doubting myself, I just kind of keep working through it. I get back to it. I I don't allow myself to focus on it for too long. I think that it can be beneficial to reflect and have an analysis like that of your work, just to kind of see what needs to be tweaked or what can be improved or like, um, it kind of makes me go into my analytics a bit more and see like where do people fall off on the video or why did this one do well 
in comparison to this, was there just a difference? Was it an algorithm situation? You know, I try and think through it that way because I feel like there's always a reason. But I think the most important thing to come out of experiencing those uh, more critical, self-critical moments is to just keep pushing through it because it's easy to see it, get discouraged, and then stop. Um, and that's just not the way to go. Um, you have people who have been trying for years and they finally have a breakthrough. So that's just... Mm -hmm. That's been a part of my routine in staying consistent, just to keep pushing through those moments of doubting. Yeah. So, and speaking of that, you're, you're saying certain things you look at and you pay attention to. How do you actually measure the success of your content or like what analytics or metrics do you typically pay attention to mm -hmm. that tells you, you know, oh, for me, this seems like this video or this content is doing well. Right. It's weird. I don't know where I got this number from. It Maybe the number came from having a goal of 10K followers on the platform. I, I feel like that number was set by so many different platforms. Or um, I remember YouTube, you had to have like 100 before you could do a custom backlink back in the day. I don't know yeah, what it was like now. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then TikTok, that was a threshold too. You didn't get the playlisting feature until you hit 10K. Um, and I'm not sure if Instagram had any regulations around that, but that always mm -hmm. been like a significant number to me. So when a post gets at least 10,000 views, I feel like, okay, that was decent. Um, and I don't know why. I I've seen posts that start off really slow and then, especially on TikTok, have taken off over time due to it being such a heavy SEO platform. You know, a lot of my content around like more fast food places that I've eaten at have taken off over time and has... Mm -hmm made like a brand reach out to me so that impact can still be a little bit more delayed but yeah it's 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 weird it, that number changes the goalposts can change depending on where i'm at and how recent things have performed yeah i always like to say that social media youtube any social media platform it's like you're in competition with yourself exactly it's like you're trying to beat your own time from before mm -hmm. You know, and if your if your threshold is ten thousand now, it's like good. And as you end up growing, it it's may change. It may change. Mm -hmm. But that's just some little check in that you can do to say, okay, I feel good about this. Right. You know, not that you should mm -hmm. feel bad about any content, but mm -hmm. you know, this this is what's doing well. This mm -hmm. is doing well. Therefore, I should do more of right. this. I will say um, that I do pay attention to my engagement rate. That's something that I check often, uh, more for like a, a brand side of things too, when you're talking about negotiations and rates and just trying to compare yourself to other people that are like within the same realm um, and same range of followers. That's more of like a business side of things to where you want to see like, okay, if they're paying this creator X amount and they have this amount of engagement, trying to see what's fair in comparison. Um, but yeah, and my engagement rate has always been high and that's been something I'm proud of. And I, I do compare it to scale. Obviously the more followers you have, it's more likely to be lower, especially if people are in like the, you know, multi thousands, you know, millions, mm -hmm. you're gonna see a really low, yeah, low. engagement rate, right? Um, but then of course there's shares and stuff and whatever, what other, and what, <laughs> can I get my words together? And um, the other analytics that, you know, matter in that way. But yeah, that's something that stands out to me too because it shows that I still have like community there. So right. it's, it's, it's still valuable. That that's the number that I definitely pay attention to. That's very important. <laughs> and uh, I didn't ask you this at first, but you're not a full-time content creator. You're still no. working. So what about juggling and balance? How do you uh, juggle your content creation mm -hmm. with the uh, demands of having a full-time job? And I think a lot of creators would want to hear you speak to that because that's where almost everybody, unless you're 12, Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's where everybody's starting out. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. I feel like having some type of system is the most important thing. And this is coming from somebody who is not organized <laughs> at all. I'm organized when I have to be and when it affects other people. If I'm working on someone's team, I have myself together. I'm very big on presentation and how I show up for others. But for me, I'll have it like things will kind of be all over the place. So I knew at the beginning it was going to be important for me to have my own posting system or reaching out to brands and keeping track of emails um, so that I wouldn't slack in my nine to five because I also make content for my nine to five too. It's in a different way. Uh, I work in government. 
Mm-hmm. And content creation isn't the only part of my job, but it's one of the main parts. Mm-hmm. And it's a bit different in government too. You have to be on top of, you know, citywide issues and, you know, updating people when things go wrong and kind of in a way being on standby. Like if a mm-hmm. major weather event happens, you got to be ready to give your attention mm-hmm. to that because you're a public servant, right? Um, so I think that I'm able to balance the two just by having one, a good system and knowing what my objectives are in general, I'll know like, hey, if our meetings are on Monday and we're kind of planning this content for the rest of the week, let me knock certain things out so I'm not feeling like, ah, so I have this thing, you know, sitting on my back that I got to push out. But then also having a really supportive team that understands who I am and what I do outside of work, mm-hmm. that's been a really big blessing to me. Oh, it's been something that, yeah, because there's not, it's not a matter of me having to like hide something or I know people who have grown their you know influence over time and their following and then their jobs have fired them because of that even when it didn't affect their performance Mm -hmm. at work Mm -hmm. so i'm grateful that i have a team that understands and believe it or not that was one of their questions that they asked me when they hired me on because within applying i submitted the application i didn't submit a portfolio and they, they told me later after i got hired like years later they were trying to look and see like oh you know what can he do and then they went to my Instagram and my TikTok, and that was a strong point why I got the job, uh, along with, you know, how I performed in my interviews and the, answer, uh, the questions that I answered. Um, but that was a big part of it. That was like my work to them that showed them what I was capable of doing. So I, I've, I've really had a lot of flexibility within my nine to five. So it works with that. I know everybody is not going to have that same chance, the same opportunity. It may look different. Um, but I feel like by having a system, it allows you to make time for it. You right. know you got to block out that time and get certain things done. You just kind of check it off of the list. That kind of keeps me going. Yeah, I think that's kind of a little bit hard. Having a system is and being organized is key, mm-hmm. but also is a little bit difficult for creatives mm-hmm. because we just like to go with the flow, do what yes. feels good, do what I feel like doing. And in and, mm-hmm. and, and this business of content creation, if you're going to get things done, you have to have a system, a list, workflow, something like that. Going yes. And so you touched on this a little earlier, but I want you to expand on what are, what's next for you in this realm of content creation? What mm-hmm. are your long-term goals, your aspirations, how do you plan on achieving them? Yeah. So it's, it's kind of like a loaded answer, but I do have structure within it. Um, One of the reasons why I want to start creating more content at home is to dive more into lifestyle content creation, right? Um, And kind of show a little bit more of my personality. I feel like I do show a good amount within my voiceovers and my typical style of content, but I feel like I'm someone with a lot of friends and I have a lot of friends because I'm able to like relate to a lot of people. I want to do that same thing and build community online, um, especially for more people like me. This is something that I've realized recently, like, man, if I had a me when I was younger, like if I knew a me existed, I would feel so much more empowered, like being queer, being black. Um, I just don't feel like I ever had an example of that. So I I was my own example where I Mm -hmm. looked to TV or, you know, thankfully I was somebody as a child who was like bold. I kind (laughs) of felt like a black sheep sometimes because my dreams and aspirations were just so different. I felt like I stood out. Um, But yeah, I and I feel like the way I can do that is by showcasing more of my personality to others. For example, I did a a vlog just like a, a morning in Austin, spending time with Tyler And I almost did not post this video because I'm like, this is a throwaway video. I'm not talking about too much. It's a vlog style. Like, you know, and I have a certain theory about vlogs whenever, you know, people don't know a whole bunch about you. you. Exactly. Right. So I'm like, but then I was like, oh, let me just put it out there. There's enough people who know, you know, maybe it'll do something. And it ended up performing extremely well. And I was so shocked. It was like so simple to me, something that would have stayed in my phone. But I'm like, no, there's something there. especially with where I am. Again, I started off the video saying the number of black people by percentage that are in Austin, Texas. And that was one of the hooks of all hooks, you know, and it's, and I spoke to Raven about this last year about being scared to do that. I'm like, I don't want to, because I am pro black, I don't want to make it seem like I'm anti anything else or I don't want 
that to deter brands from working with me or I don't want it to scare people off. Um, and it's something that people cling to. And regardless of their backgrounds, too, there are some people who are like, you know what? This creator looks like this. I feel like this demographic of people know where the spots are, know where to eat. Like, I'm going to mm-hmm. listen to them because of that. So, yeah, I, I definitely want to incorporate that into what I do going forward. Health has been a thing as far as, like, food content creation. I don't think oh. a lot of people touch on that. And I am somebody with a very sensitive system. I can gain weight super easily and I can lose it easily if I'm consistent, right? Mm -hmm. But um, I definitely took a break from playing tennis over the winter and that kind of set me back. Like I wasn't Mm -hmm. burning so many calories. There was a lot of drinking holiday campaigns and Mm -hmm. events that I was invited to and I gained like my 20 pounds that I lost back. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. okay, and that was okay. But then the doctor started saying like, hey, uh, we got to do something about this and like, okay, or you, these are certain things that you absolutely cannot have anymore. And that's scary when like diabetes, you know, mm-hmm. there's a history of diabetes in my family. High blood pressure was a thing. I was having tension headaches all the time. Mm-hmm. So it definitely made me restructure like, okay, we got to kind of figure this thing out. Like where is the balance going to come from? I wasn't cooking as much anymore. Even now I can still cook a bit more at home, but at least now when I'm eating out, I'm like at Whole Foods all the time, getting stuff from the bar, like, more salads and veggies, but I definitely want to speak to health benefits and the benefits of eating right within my content too, Mm -hmm. and kind of encompass it as like a whole lifestyle platform. So I feel like food is just my first step within that. Cause there's other things that we got to think about what we're wearing to go out to eat if it's a date night, what fragrance, like there's so many other points that I feel like can be expanded toward, um, with the, with food as my base. So I plan to do all of that. I love that. I know Mm -hmm. that I say all the time that creators who have a large following and what they're doing is quote unquote lifestyle, that typically they didn't start off doing everything. They typically started off doing one thing and then they built their audience and then they started little by little sharing more and more of themselves. And I think that's perfect for you because especially just, uh, being an example and and being someone who can say this is the kind of life style that appeals to me mm-hmm. you know it's not it's not um well, i don't want to say run of the mill but there is a little bit of uniqueness to it just based on the demographics there's a little mm-hmm. bit of uniqueness to it and mm-hmm. therefore it draws people's attention so i definitely think that that is uh, a good direction for you to go in so do you think that you will ever be full-time? I, I do. It's so interesting to um, speak about. Um, and I used to be afraid of it. I'm like, oh, I can't talk about that out loud because I have a job and what, if, you know what I mean? But I'm like, none of that is guaranteed. It, it's a little bit more secure for me because I work in government versus like um, private sector. But and I think I have a team that knows who they joke about it. Like, when are you going to leave? When's your big break? Like, you know, so it makes it a bit more comfortable. But I do eventually. Um, with my skill set, sometimes when I'm looking at like job listings or how I've looked at open positions in the past, sometimes I feel like that's not it. I can do these things, but it's not exactly meant for me because I can also do this for myself, mm-hmm. like at some point, you know. Um, and I think I enjoy the contract style of working like with brands so you know they have a certain campaign that they Mm -hmm. need you to you know fulfill that role and then i also really appreciate the freedom that can come along with that as well and i know that there are trade-offs for sure the reason why i went back to work after freelancing as a photographer for nine months was because i miss getting that paycheck every two weeks and then um, health benefits insurance (laughs) like that was a huge thing, right? And so now when I think about it, I'm like, okay, whenever it's time for that again, make sure that's allocated into your budget. Like, yes. since you're not a planner, make sure you are meeting with somebody's accountant or talking to people that um, have more money than you and, you know, have been doing this for years and are able to answer certain questions, which is another thing for another day. But I feel like we don't do enough in the Black community. Mm-hmm. So I'm trying mm-hmm. to change that because it really does just help. And I'm not someone that's like trying to bite and take in looking to take advantage i genuinely would just like to have the knowledge of it of how to operate and do these things because i haven't had a lot of exposure to it like coming from like working class family or you know 
probably the second person within my immediate family to like actually go to college and graduate. Like there's just certain things that I haven't seen that in my adult life I've been exposed to and I'm able to ask questions. Um, so yeah, that, yeah. that definitely has impacted me, but you know, working full time as a content creator would still be a dream. Um, yeah. And it, it's in the works. Like it's, it's in my plans. I feel like it's yeah. possible. I'm yeah. glad to hear that. Thank well, you. I know that we don't do as good a job, our community in sharing mm -hmm knowledge especially when it comes to business especially when it comes to finance especially when it comes to money mm -hmm. but yes in understanding that being a full-time content creator basically means you're self-employed a absolutely it means your health insurance you know you may think to yourself well i'm gonna have to pay for my own health insurance but have you checked in to see how much it is Woo. that's like it having a baby pricey. that's like saying i'm gonna have a baby i don't know how much daycare it is and i've seen some people do that too <laughs> that's but, scary you know <laughs> Have you seen how much health insurance is and what it actually yes. covers? It's outrageous. And have you seen, do you know, you know, another thing, actually, I've been an entrepreneur for years and years and years, but I know that as an entrepreneur for the first part of my life before I, be, you know, in my 20s, I really wasn't making that much money. Mm -hmm. So taxes weren't really a thing. And then I remember mm -hmm. I got my first big contract into my 30s and it was a lot of money. And I was, I think about estimated taxes. At the end of the year, the IRS hit me with that bill. I was like, what? <laughs> so especially if you are ramping up your income, you're starting to make money. You need to understand the IRS wants their portion right. with a quickness and they're going to get it. There is no mm -hmm. getting out of it. That health insurance taxes, and then also just having the, the cushion some money set aside. I talked about that in my last podcast with a, a beauty creator, Megan, mm -hmm. and she was saying, you know, it's up and down. You never know when that next check is going to come. Mm -hmm. And so it's a good idea to encourage creators before you go full time, mm -hmm. put some money aside for those lean times. Right. Uh, but, you know, it's preparation. Once you're aware and you know how to prepare for it, you can do it and, you know, Mm -hmm. Full time with no problem, and then you can always get another job. There's no, there's not a deal where you know if I leave this job, I'll never get another one. Right. You can always get another job, but yes. there's something to be said for that health insurance, and mm -hmm. you know, getting that paycheck every Friday. You mm -hmm. know, being someone who ha is a serial entrepreneur, mm -hmm. every several years I go and work for somebody, mm -hmm. and I'm just genuinely surprised on Friday, on the first and fifteenth. I'm like. <laughs> Where this money come from? There's right? something there, and it doesn't matter whether yeah. whether you worked. I mean, if you're on an you're an hourly or salary salary mm -hmm. especially, you could work hard that week or not hard, and that right. money is still going to be the same. Mm -hmm. Not so when you have your own business, right? You know, you're getting out of it what you're putting in. What you put into it, I think that's really important to touch on. And I have a one of my closer friends that um, is a, a content creator as well. The first day I met her, we've known each other for like probably four years now. She had just two days prior gotten let go from her nine to five. And it was because she was a content creator. And long story short, and it didn't affect her job at all. She was still able to produce the work, but they had gotten a new boss that had just been made aware of like, oh, she has this growing presence online. And that sent her into a new stratosphere with her content creation. So she's very skilled. So in the meantime, she was like doing hair, and then taking on a bunch of smaller campaigns. But she's also a hustler. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of people miss out on that aspect. I'm like, mm -hmm. you guys are looking at my friend group and seeing so-and-so landing these deals. But y'all don't also know they are pitching themselves as well. Or if they have a, a full team and, you know, deals are just coming in, they have managers. They were pitching themselves beforehand and saying, hey, this mm -hmm. is who I am. This is what I can offer. And that's what my friend was doing. She had mm -hmm. a system down. She was reaching out to, like, I don't know, hundreds of brands or different campaigns at least mm -hmm. each month knowing like even if I only land a few of them there's still a smaller percentage right if I'm reaching out if I'm sending 50 pitch emails and I only get 10 and I'm charging I'm just gonna throw a number out there at least a thousand for mm -hmm. each brand deal I know at least okay that's my 5k for the month and that's gonna go here here and there um so that's a part of it that I think really needs to be acknowledged before you get to a spot of where they're just flowing in on their own you may yeah. be required to do some yeah. hustling it may take yeah. that so, and Mind that's you, something that I'm prepared for. Mind you, you are pitching, mm -hmm. you are creating organic mm -hmm. for nothing. You are Man. creating sponsored. That is work. That's a job. It's work. Yes. It is work. You better love it because yep. you're going to be a 
doing it 24 7 uh, mm-hmm. what was i yesterday i was in the apple store and getting <laughs> something and the, the guy who was helping me said so uh he asked me what i did i told him he's like so are you off tomorrow or something like that it was try it was yesterday mm-hmm. i was like i just looked at him he goes no nah, you work you work 20, you work seven days <laughs> 20, like I said, mm-hmm. right like what is actually I, off what is an off day right i don't have an off day but i love it so mm-hmm. i don't i don't mind yeah so that the flexibility, the creativity, those are all the fun, the money when it starts coming in are all the fun sides mm-hmm. of being a content creator. I want to ask you, like, what is your favorite part about being a content creator and why? And then on the flip side, what's your mm-hmm. least favorite part? Got it. My favorite part is that creating content allows me to express my creativity I can edit for hours and I know some people who hate editing and there are certain things that I hate editing, like retouching a photo that takes hours. That's like, it's like a task and it's, it kind of feels like math to me and I don't like math. So it feels like a tedious task, but editing a vlog and like adding different elements, certain effects, transitions, background music, creating that is fun. And it's because I also love consuming that as well. I love watching creators that take their time and, you know, make, great forms of entertainment. So I really appreciate that part of it. Um, And then also making things that other people enjoy and that helps them. Like there's a smile put on my face. Anytime I get a thank you email from a business or I go back in and they're like, hey, we've really been busy after your post. Like, thank you. Just thank you for Mm -hmm. stopping by. Like I get a sense of fulfillment from that because I'm like, this is something that I created and I was able to produce this result and have this type of impact. And then just people having good experiences around food in general, since that's my main focus right now. So I love that. I love that, you know, people are able to go out with their mom and take her to a nice place and have a good experience because I know they're going to remember that. So feeling like I was a part of that beginning, if I they went to a spot that mm-hmm. I recommend, that gives me some type of joy because I love that. I love anything that's like family oriented or um, based around interpersonal connections. I really mm-hmm. value that. Um, so those things make me happy when it comes to content creation. On the flip side of that, um, I feel like it's it can be stressful whenever people like can take the content and like spin their own narratives or just like create something that doesn't exist to tell a negative story. Um, and I dealt with that a lot in the beginning. I actually dealt with it so much working with other brands that would boost certain posts or like put money behind it mm-hmm. um, for like a sponsorship or a campaign. And you get people from everywhere when that happens. Mm-hmm. Um, and it can bring some really hateful comments. Oh, and yeah. like with me being a naturally defensive person, I'm like, why does this exist? Like if I see something and I don't like it, I'm either scrolling past it, ignoring it. If, and I'll admit, like we all have a little bit of chatter here. Mm-hmm. I'll do that privately <laughs> with friends. Yeah. Like I may DM it to somebody yes. and share my opinions, but in no way, shape or form am I hopping in somebody's comments to spew negativity because I don't see any benefit in doing that. So being that I don't operate that way, I really have a hard time understanding when other people do it to me. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I definitely have like certain filter words that people just cannot say that if they want to leave that harsh comment, they have to be very good with their words and explain <laughs> things that come across a different way because they're simply not allowed to do it. So that's just a boundary that I set for my personal piece. And with that being said, um, that kind of takes away the majority of the parts of creating content that I don't really like. Cause other than that, that keeps it, that keeps it fun. I'm not allowed to get invested to invest into the negativity. Good. Good. Yeah. We talked about that. I think it's going to be a thing on every podcast. Always. That everybody says the same thing. It's like, who does this? Maybe I'll meet one of these people one time and they'll <laughs> explain to me why they do it, but we don't know what they do. Why and I doubt it. it. I doubt mm-hmm. it. You know, yeah. it's a different thing when you have a keyboard warrior, but I will say, I am also open to critique and I like to challenge people when they have certain things to say only to have a better perspective, a better understanding of their perspective rather. So if someone's saying, I went to this place and I hated it, I'm asking you like, why didn't you like the food? Like, or, you know, what was it about the experience that made it a negative one? And some people can't even provide that. And I'm like, if you can't provide that answer, I don't know your first comment was worth it. Because if I'm in a bad mood that day, you know what I mean? And just felt like that's where you're going to project and this is your platform to release where really it's not, but that's how you felt. 
in that moment. Because if I'm on the flip side of it, saying something I didn't like, I'm telling you why. I didn't enjoy this because it tasted like this and I'm used to this. Um, mm-hmm. I grew up eating these flavors, so it's not like that. I'll, you know, there's an explanation. There's a why. And that's what makes that's what makes criticism constructive. And I think that's that should be yes. the goal. You know, if yes. the goal is to get in there and project, that's opposite. We don't have to have that conversation. <laughs> yes. Good thing there's a block and delete button. Exactly. You can take advantage of. Thank you. Exactly. You curate your audience. Like you curate your feed, you can curate your audience. Mm-hmm. It's like, boop, you're gone. You don't have to be here. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, what advice would you give to someone mm-hmm. who is just starting out in content creation? What's your okay. one piece of advice you can give? I would... I would advise somebody to keep going and to not get discouraged. And I don't want it to be just as simple as that. Cause sometimes people can't keep going and not get discouraged in like the wrong direction. And what, <laughs> yes. I, and what I mean by that is you have to be um, an active listener. You have to be aware. You have to know what is and what isn't working for you. Actually be real with yourself and do a deep dive analysis and, kind of compare certain things. If, if I want to try to go in a different direction, I'm going to test whatever that concept or that thought is out and see what the natural feedback is to see if it's worth the investment because it's still an investment of time, resources, and energy, right? Time. And to have that active listening to see is this working, right? And some things take time to work, but I would have like a trial period, right? And kind of mm-hmm. navigate through that. Um, but generally to just Keep trying certain things. And I I feel like you start to get to the analysis part of it by being consistent and by not giving up. You start to see what works for you and what doesn't. Um, So that's the main thing. And um, another thing that I would want to add on to that is to not think you have to have it all together. Um, I remember I was very specific with filming with like even my actual DSLR camera when I first started. And I started noticing like even people with better equipment than me sometimes the it wasn't landing because mm-hmm. their storytelling wasn't there or the value wasn't there. The stock the shots were beautiful, mm-hmm. um, but there were more important components that were missed and it mm-hmm. wasn't um building the rapport with the audience and wasn't producing results. Um for anyone who wants to know, I shoot all of my content on an iPhone. Um wow. Yeah, every single thing you shot on an iPhone. Um, before I used to do like photos, at least for the cover photo with the camera, that I've, you know, I'm not afraid to do. I still might jump back into that, but it's, it just became more efficient to not carry all of that with me because I'm always carrying a mobile tripod and at least a light. Um, a lot of people <laughs> still ask me about like photography stuff from my photography days, like where that was like my full time gig and, you know, just about camera settings in general. So I, I will dive into that a little bit. I don't want to mm-hmm. make it my whole thing, but yeah. I, I do feel like it's important for people to know how accessible it is to create content like what I create. So I'll be sharing yes. like those type of tips. Yeah. You know, and, and I feel like we have these phones that are expensive, especially if you have an iPhone um, mm-hmm. or, you know, whatever, uh, Samsung, whatever. There are a bunch of great phones that have a nice you know dollar amount attached to them it's important to get to know your phone and know what's possible with it um so yeah definitely gotta gotta share that but yeah people need to know because they can do it too Um, they can at least try right they can at least try if they have that curiosity so yeah definitely don't be afraid to start with what you have well this has been great is there anything (laughs) else that you want to talk about or mention that i didn't bring up we covered so much, and I oh. talked so much. I can keep going if you let me. I, we so can, it's we like can have a part two because <laughs> I, I thought of a whole nother line of questioning mm-hmm. I wanted to go in, but I'll have yeah. to have you back, and we can have a part two. But I think that this for sure. particular episode will be so helpful for yeah. people who are, you know, a year, six months, a year into the content creation to mm-hmm. give them uh, encouragement to tell them what the real deal is, what to mm-hmm. expect, how things really are. I, like I said, I want to keep this podcast uh, extremely candid, mm-hmm. honest, and hopefully sharing some information that you may not have known before you watched the, the podcast. Yes. So thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks and for having I'm me. I'm going to have you back on again. Absolutely. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, y'all.